Today, as the King George VI lift bridge begins a new chapter in its life, we can also look back on its eight decades of service to the small community of Port Stanley, Ontario. One afternoon, 82 years ago, on May 15, 1939, the Empress of Australia was steaming up the St. Lawrence, bearing King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, who were about to begin the first visit of a reigning monarch to Canada. In Port Stanley, a half-a-day holiday was declared, and the entire village and their guests assembled to dedicate a new bridge named in honour of the King's arrival in Canada, a bridge that had been over 20 years in the making. As early as 1915, one of Port Stanley's longest-serving reeves, Nathan Cornell, led a committee of county council to Ottawa to present a case to the Minister of Public Works for a swing or lift bridge to allow the opening of an upper harbour. The port was booming in those years. Fishing was at its height. Here many fishing tugs can be seen lining the lower harbour. Ferries such as the Theodore Roosevelt were also arriving in the harbour on a regular basis from Cleveland and other U.S. ports. The London and Port Stanley Railway had recently been taken over by the City of London and electrified. The railway built a bathhouse and a restaurant and also improved the picnic grounds and rebuilt the boardwalk. Soon thousands of people were descending on Port Stanley every day in the summer to swim in the lake and picnic on the heights. The village wanted to develop an upper harbour, but the existing narrow iron bridge was too low to allow larger vessels to pass beneath it. Many visitors were also now arriving by car, and the narrow iron bridge, built in 1894, was no match for the vehicle traffic of the 1930s. By the time the new bridge was announced, in 1937, the old one had been restricted to local traffic only. The amount of freight landed at Port Stanley was also on the rise. So much so that by the time the new bridge opened in 1939, the port was receiving over 80,000 tons of coal a year, 10,000 tons of regular freight, and 15 million gallons of gasoline, much of it brought in by Shell and Thayer's for their service stations. The long wait for the bridge was brought to an end in 1934 by the election of a Liberal government in Ontario led by Premier Mitchell Hepburn, who was also Elgin County's member in the legislature. The Department of Highways had also just designated William and Bridge Streets as part of the Highway No. 4, and so the bridge now fell under its jurisdiction. The new bridge was to be a double-leaf bascule, or lift bridge, bascule being the French word for seesaw. This type of bridge is opened by releasing a counterweight on a set of gears, which slowly drops it into a deep well, bringing the bridge deck up to an almost upright position. The bridge deck and its counterweight are so well balanced that, if necessary, the bridge can be raised and lowered by hand. To house this bridge's two massive 250-ton counterweights, concrete vaults had to be fitted deep into the riverbed. This required an extensive excavation at each end of the bridge. In order to dig that deep into the riverbed, a cofferdam had to be constructed in the river surrounding the area to be excavated. Once in place, the water was pumped out. Steam-driven excavators and pile drivers were used to build the cofferdam, which would hold back the river water during construction. Work started on September 1, 1937, on the East Bastion, and by December, the digging had reached a spot 30 feet below the surface and 10 feet below the riverbed. On the evening of December 19, the night crew were smoothing out the bottom of the excavation when they heard the dam's support timbers start to crack. Almost before they could move, the whole dam collapsed, burying them in 30 feet of freezing water. The sound of the collapsing dam was heard across the village, and help came running. Five men were rescued from the water-filled hole, leaving eight unaccounted for. A diver brought from Hamilton was sent down the next day, and eventually recovered all the bodies. An inquest failed to find a direct cause, and it could only recommend that future cofferdams receive closer inspections. 
Eight men died in the water-filled East Bastion of the bridge on December 19, 1937. Work did not resume until the spring of 1938, and by the summer, the east abutment was completed and the excavation for the west abutment was started. Meanwhile, the bridge leaves, controls, machinery, and traffic gates were fabricated in Montreal by the Dominion Bridge Company and shipped to the site at Port Stanley. The opening day ceremony on May 15, 1939, started at 4.30 in the afternoon with a ribbon cutting by Mrs. Cornell the widow of the Reeve who had started the campaign for a new bridge. She was assisted by the Minister of Highways, Thomas B. McQuesten, as well as Mrs. Eva Hepburn, the Premier's wife, and Mrs. Beatrice Wheaton, the wife of the Reeve. Three plaques were unveiled, and then a car carrying the dignitaries became the first to cross the bridge. As the bridge aged, a few of its components needed work. In 1974, the deck was replaced, and in 1978, the lift gear mechanism was overhauled. In 1994, the Valvoline Motor Oil Company filmed a commercial on the bridge. In it, a car runs out of oil in the middle of the bridge while the driver, not realizing it's a lift bridge, checks under the hood and then walks off in search of help. Just then, the bridge begins to lift. Halfway through the lift, the car was supposed to topple into the river. The car was actually suspended from a crane, and a release was to be pulled once the car reached a high enough point to make an impressive fall. But the release failed, and the crew had to push it over the edge. Glenn Hindley, the bridge operator at the time, shot the whole production from the bridge's control tower. Jesus, right on the, roof. the County of Elgin's decision to undertake the recent refurbishment of the bridge represents a substantial commitment to the bridge's future. The $5.2 million cost is roughly equivalent today to its original $250,000 construction cost. The rehabilitation work includes the upgrading of its mechanical, electrical, and control systems, as well as installing new standby power generation, repainting throughout, and recreating its original lighting fixtures. The work will allow what has become one of the village's historic sites to remain in operation for years to come.